Um, I know Bryn for like right around six years. We met because we worked together um, in RoboRace. And um, the reason why we invited Bryn today here to this talk is because we think he's one of the autonomous racing pioneers because he started with RoboRace, he set up the car and he knows how to develop autonomous vehicles. Um, what you see in these pictures here below on the right corner is the RoboRace, RoboRace dev board. Uh, looks a little bit sketchy, but it drives. You see the roll car with the NVIDIA livery here on the right side. And you see the dev board number two. We invited him also because he's a motorsports and racing competition expert. He has like a long history with Formula One. He knows a lot of people and knows how to set up competitions um, so to make them fun. Last but not least, he's also the founder of a nonprofit open alliance called ADA, which has the aim to accelerate the development and adoption of trusted human centric artificial intelligence. I welcome Bryn today to this workshop. Um, Bryn, I make you now um, a host, and then you can share your screen. One second. Hi, Bryn. You're now host. We can see Perfect. you and yeah. we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, just let me uh, share my screen. Yeah, we can see your screen. So and we can hopefully, you. you can see my screen. We can see it. Good. One second, though. I need to clear. That's it. And. Okay, can you see everything okay? Yes, we can see it and hear you loud and clearly. Perfect, and thank you very much for the kind introduction to Johannes. It has been a long time, definitely. Um, and I'm, I really appreciate the invitation to speak here today. Um, so I just wanted to touch on um, the sort of future directions that we're moving in, a little bit of where we've been. Um, so, you know, the title of the talk is Casper versus Deep Blue. Um, so. Uh, I'm assuming everybody knows about Kasparov versus Deep Blue, so I won't go into detail, but it was a challenge that really started in 1985 and ran until 1997. So that was a 12-year journey. And there were some you know, key milestones uh, along that journey. It obviously started as a, a university project, very much like a lot of where autonomous motorsport is at the moment. It started as computers chess championship so computer versus computer again very much similar to where we are with autonomous motorsport at the moment um, and, and then we started to move into the human versus uh, computer competition starting in sort of 1989 which was a, a failure and then moving into 1996 still a failure but became the first to win a game against a, a world champion and then 97 when uh, finally beat Gary Kasparov 2-1 and three draws. So it was a nice 12 year journey. Um, I just wonder where we are in autonomous motorsport after 12 years. And it's interesting, you know, picking the start date for that. I mean, I could argue that it starts now, um, but I, I went with the, the, the first one that I felt really inspired some motorsport activity. And that was really Stanford running up the Pikes Peak hill climb. So that would be, you know, it's a classic motorsport venue. First time autonomy had been on there. Uh, in 2014, we had uh, Audi driving on Hockenheim as a racetrack. 2016, we launched uh, Robocar, which was the world's first purpose-built autonomous race car. And then we did demonstrations around the world with, with Formula E. Uh, I say demonstrations, it was really uh, development in front of public. So you know, it, it, I wouldn't recommend doing that. It's incredibly challenging, but uh, it, it, it certainly helped with that initial phase of development. Um, first, Robocar first run up Goodwood, Robocar sets the world record uh, for fastest speed. Uh, DevBot reaches uh, human parity in a lap time challenge against Formula E champion. So that was against Lucas Degrassi, that was in 2021. Then obviously we had the Indy AV challenge. And then uh, just recently, Polymove went and beat the Robo race record, but using the IAC car. Um, so that's been, the, that's been the 12 years. And, it, and it's interesting, have, have we had that Kasparov moment or are, is that Kasparov moment still to come? So um, just to 
give you a little insight into you know a little bit of the rover race performance trajectory you know when we when we started we did, you know did comparisons with lucas de grassi who's a formula e champion at the time and we were like 20 percent, 30 percent slower than lucas de grassi right at the very beginning and then over time we managed to try and improve that M most of that improvement came through better vehicle dynamics control but also better uh, localization of the vehicle. So knowing exactly where that vehicle was in order to optimize that racing, uh, that racing line. Um, and then you, you can see that the, the progress gets harder and harder and harder the closer you get to human parity. But it, in some ways, there's a rule in Formula One that says for you to qualify, you have to be within 107% of the fastest driver. And, and you can reach that milestone a lot earlier. So you can get into the right ballpark for human competition a lot earlier than you can beating the world champion or beating a champion. And, and that makes obvious logical sense. You know, a rookie can enter Formula One, but it still takes them some period of time before they become a champion. Um, I really liked uh, a paper that Johannes and a lot of the organizers of the conference worked on and the challenges that they set out. Um, I, would, I would agree with all of these challenges. I think, um, challenge sort of two, three, and four all kind of looped together in sort of in one area. Uh, balancing safety and performance, I would say, is kind of risk and reward. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely like the, the comments that were made in the paper about uh, risk. Uh, autonomous racing regulations is actually why we started ADA. So it was a spin out from Rover Race in 2018, specifically to look at the rules and regulations for autonomous motorsport, because it sits outside of the, FIA's jurisdiction and interest. Um, we've actually then since taken that work over to the U uh, over to the United Nations, and we've been doing a lot of work on in-service monitoring and reporting for on-road applications and guiding future regulation. So it, it, it will be great now to see that work coming back into autonomous motorsport. Um, and then the other two, I, I think, you know, just uh, frame, frameworks and hardware. So definitely agree with that. Um, but what was the destination of the journey that we're on with autonomous motorsport? Where, where are we going? If we solve all of those things, what are we achieving or how are we going to showcase that? Um, so last year, we did some really interesting uh, research with uh, Salome Brack. Uh, it was part of her PhD thesis. And it was really to look at Generation Z, you know, the next generation coming through and their interest in motorsport, but then interest in different potential formats of motorsport. And you can see on the, on the sort of complicated uh, uh, bar, chart, bar charts that we have on the right, um, human versus A, it refers to human versus AI or human versus robot competition. And that came out as being the most attractive format for Gen Z. Then the next one down, which is HG and A, was human versus gamer versus robot. So that's the ability to have a human driven race car on the track at the same time as a remotely controlled race car, teleoperated, and then uh, an autonomous race car. And then human versus human, uh, AI versus AI, human versus gamer, gamer versus AI. And the least popular was gamer versus gamer. And that's, it, that's interesting because at, from a commercial perspective. So gamer versus gamer is probably the cheapest form of motorsport to activate. At the moment, it gets a lot of hype in the industry about it's great to engage Gen Z, but when you actually do the research, it's the least interesting to Gen Z. The encouraging thing though, is human versus robot, human versus AI is the most attractive form of future motorsport. Um, and so I think that's the direction that I wanted to, to touch on in this talk. What does that actually mean? Um, so great. We've established that human versus, ro uh, versus robot major sport is the most popular, but what, what discipline is the pinnacle? And it's a little bit, I wouldn't, uh, it's a little bit of a personal choice, uh, but we have heard reference to Formula One a few times. Um, I could argue for Le Mans, I could argue for World Rally Championship, uh, I could argue for Indy, especially the uh, Indianapolis 500, um, but 
I think if you want to reach worldwide interest, it has to be Formula One. So human versus robot racing in Formula One, what are the challenges? The very first is parity. And, that, and that's very, it's very simple to say, but parity kind of, if you're gonna race against Lewis Hamilton, for example, you have to do it in a Formula One car, but you can't modify that Formula One car. And I, I, with the Indy A, AV Challenge, it was, it was really interesting to see, yes, it was a standard car, but it became adapted. And then it ended up being a specific version of that Dallara. So it used a common chassis, but it actually wasn't the same car that a human would be driving. And if you're gonna have a competition, you, you, you need to be sure that you have parity in the competition. And we experienced that with, with Rover Race when we were doing challenges with Lucas, we would have the DevBot, Lucas would jump in and drive the DevBot, we'd set lap times, all looks fairly, fairly even, until you say, well, actually when Lucas isn't in the car, we're saving 80 kilos of weight. Uh, when Lucas was driving the car, what was the configuration? He didn't have torque vectoring on the car, so we gave the robot uh, better controls. So he effectively had a, a fixed axle at the back. And so it, it, you suddenly start to pick apart the parity point. And if you're gonna do something as a human versus robot competition, parity remains number one. Uh, and uh, Ada, we've been working on that for the last uh, three years and filed a pattern back in 2018 that makes sure that we have a system that would enable that parity. So great, we can do that. Then what are the challenges? What else? What comes next? Um, and I wanted to rattle through these quite quickly because I, you know, I like the Q&A session at the end, but um, the first is initializing in the garage. We did this on day one at Rover Race. First thing you have to do, sit inside the garage, pull out into the pit lane. Uh, that's an unsolved problem. It, 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 with all the systems that we have at the moment, that understanding of where that vehicle is located, the first time you turn it on, in order to know where it's gonna go is an unsolved problem. So before we can even start with competition, we need to solve that problem. In road race, we initialized externally uh, on the track in clear open sky. Uh, the, the next I wanted to show was just uh, pit lane, but particularly uh, the lights, so status. Again, we were able to do this through data, sharing data with the vehicle, but ultimately it's the lights that have the final say. Uh, and so being able to detect the lights, again, it's very much like the traffic light problem, but being able to detect those becomes important. In this case, you can't exit because it's a red light, for example, and there's a blue light indicating there's traffic coming down on the uh, left hand side. Uh, following on from that, it's not only lights, then it becomes flags. So flags take priority over lights. So yes, you have light panels, but if the flag's out, that takes the priority. Uh, and we've seen instances where that's affected world championships. So are we able to detect flags? Actually, that's a super difficult problem. Uh, given, given the range that we're trying to detect them and then differentiating between single yellow wave flags and double wave yellow flags would be a challenge. Um, but that, that would be another thing to solve. Um, just being able to formulate on the grid in a grid position is, is a challenge, but also doing the tire warm up in order to form onto the grid is a challenge. So um, you know, laying the rubber down both when you leave, when you're coming back to the grid after the formation lap, making sure that you can uh, warm up the tires in the correct way and then obviously detect the, the, the start lights as well to move off. Complexity at the start is probably the highest and that goes back to some of the points that have been raised in the research topic. But if you want to solve complexity, it's not just one car racing against another, it's all of these cars proceeding at the same time into the same corner. Uh, and you can see it's incredibly, it's incredibly challenging. So I, I think if we can solve that, you know, with the 20 cars, 24 cars, then uh, that, that's really good progress. Um, first corner is that obviously that's where the congestion then occurs. Uh, your braking is all affected by the other cars that are around you, the aerodynamics that you experience, the front load, uh, from front wing load changes depending on where you are to the car in front. And so understanding all of those things 
is again another massive challenge when you're dealing with the complexity of that environment when you're driving all weather conditions so yes it was lovely it was sunny in spain just at the weekend but uh, imola uh, was incredibly wet and the challenges that that throws up for both visual visual as in cameras plus then any lidar that you have on the vehicle is immense so you know being able to have that robustness in your perception system it is going to be really really important um fo following on from that vehicle dynamics in the wet is an absolute nightmare uh especially when you're dealing with different lateral grip so whether you're on the curb on what with one set of wheels compared to the track on the other set of wheels or there's a dry line that's appearing uh being able to recover the vehicle from a spin so it's not just spin stop stuck it's kind of recover from the spin and then get going again is also another thing that it would be great to see us 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 solve that type of problem um when you don't pull that off successfully being able to handle safety car safety car periods um not not only that it's a different phase of the race it's a different type of formation that you need to um uh, to, uh, different type of driving that you need to do safety car restarts especially if you're the lead car become really important um but the, and i say safety car uh, but during that safety car period you may have to deal with things that are irregular as in there will be some blockage somewhere on the track and in the case of Imola again in uh, earlier this year there was actually a marshal walking on the track so we would assume that the racetrack is clear you know there's no flags but in this instance being able to detect people in that environment becomes safety critical so and it's assumed that humans will be able to do that and i think that's something that we shouldn't overlook uh, when we're looking at autonomous motorsport um controversially at the end of last season with Abu Dhabi uh, there's a safety car procedure everyone thought they understood what the safety car procedure was that either all lapped cars are allowed to overtake or uh, no lapped cars are allowed to overtake it turns out that there was some discretion in that rule and i think that goes back to the uh, point that was made in the research um that uh, formalizing those rules becomes really important and i think you'll see a presentation uh later on from pete at sony which talks about the variability that you get in the, the if humans are the ones responsible for implementing those rules and some of the things that we've been working on at ada are to look at how you encode those rules on board the vehicle and you actually have on board stewards rather than relying on human stewards so um that that's one of the things that we've been, been working on um so talking of rules um the, the, the track is that piece of gray tarmac that's over to the right hand side um qu quite what max and lewis were doing out there uh is it, it, <laughs> another matter um but a, a lot of the time when we talk about risk there isn't awareness in the ai system of things outside of the track boundary now when you're racing in say uh, if you're racing in Indy or if you're doing a lot of the events in Formula E, then outside the track boundary is normally a concrete wall. So you don't want to be exceeding the track boundary. Uh, however, runoff areas are there and they're there for a reason, and that is for safety. Um, you can see in this case, those two drivers exploited that additional buffer for safety from a competitive perspective. So understanding what those runoff areas are, where they are, when they should be used how to use them when, you're, uh, when your vehicle has a technical problem, but also how to push the limits so that you know that if you exceed the limits, actually you, you could safely recover the vehicle. That, that becomes really important when you're actually pushing for performance. So it will be, again, great to see uh, that type of research. Um, uh, this was an example of track limits that just happened uh, yesterday. Uh, Spain. So this was Lando Norris's qualifying lap. He's exceeded track limits there. Now, that doesn't look like he's exceeded track limits, which gives you that impression that you're, you're talking about centimeters of accuracy. And, and getting that level of accuracy in, in localization is going to be really important unless you want your lap time deleted and therefore you don't progress into from Q2 to Q3. And then that has a knock on impact into your race performance. So it's really important when we do establish these rules and we do then have uh, very clear guidelines, we're able to meet those rules uh, with the accuracy of our perception systems or localization systems. 
Uh, driving in the pit lane, uh, in general, we don't do that in Rover Race. Uh, we didn't do that in Rover Race. We stopped, at the, we came into the pits, we stopped at pit, uh, just before the beginning of the pit lane where the humans were. Uh, and then we, we always drove uh, manually through the rest of the, the pit lane. Um, again, they're incredibly complex environments with cars moving in and out, with lots of people around. It's probably the most high risk environment that you drive in. Um, in some ways you could argue it requires a different type of driver. And from a safety perspective, there may be a, a desire from the regulators to switch into a safety driver that's common between all teams when they come into this environment and treat it as a non-competitive environment. So the only thing that becomes competitive is the stop time. The actual coming in and then leaving would be more controlled. Um, so that's one of the things, but even being able to come in and stop at 80 kilometers an hour with the mechanics around you and someone standing directly in front of you, that again is gonna be incredibly challenging for any AI system to be able to do and to do that with confidence. So we can ignore it, but if you ignore it, you're never racing in a, against the human in a long distance race. So it's something that definitely needs to be solved as a, a technical challenge um, and to be able to do that safely and, uh, you know, and hopefully not end up in these types of situations with the, the mechanic. Um, the other one that we'd have to deal with is driving through tunnels, particularly in Monaco. So there are a lot of other challenges in Monaco. One of them that's unique is the tunnel. So if you're, if you're using anything to do with GPS uh, inertial localization, uh, that's not going to work through the tunnel. So being able to do that and then dealing with images where you get the overexposed image that you see outside and the transition uh, that you see as you move from the, the night to the, uh, sorry, sorry, the inside to the outside, that becomes a big challenge as well. So, you yeah, know, that, again, if you, if you want to have an impact, probably Monaco is going to be the race in Formula One to, to have the biggest impact in terms of worldwide recognition for the AI beating a human. Um, other, ty other types of night events, obviously there have been more added to the calendar. Um, Singapore was, was one of the first, um, but we have like, uh, Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar as well. Um, slightly different in that the, the level of lighting around the track uh, is significant. It's almost as you can see here, like daylight conditions on the track but effectively you end up with very different visual cues that you would use day versus night. Uh, and so that, that's, very, that's gonna be very interesting uh, if you're using any sort of visual perception for localization. Uh, and then the final one I wanted to touch on was um, driving in non-optimal vehicle conditions. So this is Lewis Hamilton at Silverstone when he drove I think two thirds of a lap with one flat tire. Um, a lot of the models that we build tend to assume the vehicle is as the vehicle model describes. Uh, being able to adapt to when the vehicle isn't in that state, being able to understand that and then still be able to drive the vehicle back and control it is going to be something that's important if you want to be racking up those, those points in, in a Formula One championship. And then finally, yeah, you need to repeat that on 22 different circuits. That's 66 different practice sessions, 66 knockout qualifying sessions. Do that 22 races of 300 kilometers each. Do that in wet and dry, day and night. And then each year for seven years, if you're looking to take on Lewis Hamilton as a seven times driver's world champion. And I think realistically, he would be the, the, the driver in... Uh, let's say in Formula One that would match sort of Gary Kasparov's experience in chess. So um, very happy to open that up to discussions a bit later, but I just wanted to set the scene. There's a lot of things to solve and it would be great as we're doing that research that we have a practical application for solving the, some of these problems to bring this future of human versus robot motorsport to life. And with that, I'll hand back to Johannes. <laughs>